Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, um, my name's Neil Stephen Reddy. Um, I've been, I'm a farmer of two. I've been writing since I was, however, a lot old, and I live out in the wilds of Boston in Lincolnshire, which is probably why this line is so bad. Uh, so how did you find out about Weasel Press? I found out about Weasel Press by a Tumblr, one of your publications, the name escapes me, but it's the one you use as your logo. The Jesus motherfucker, was it? Oh, yeah, y'all motherfuckers need Jesus. That's it. That's the one. That caught my attention. <laughs> you, you, say, you say it better than I do. You know, that word kind of works better from an American mouth than it does from an English one. <laughs> Now that the book is out, you know, you can see it on Amazon and all of that. Uh, how do you feel about it? I can even hold it. Yeah, um, um, it's, it's startling, to be honest, to, uh, to see it and to hold it. And actually, after all this time, to see something that's solidly mine. So... It's quite wonderful, really, if I'm to be honest. Um, yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. Lovely cover. The cover, I know, I keep looking at it, and a lot of people who have seen it are very, very caught by the cover. So my, uh, once again, my thanks out to the lovely artist who did that. Lovely work. Take us through some of the work that's in, in the book. Uh, Gosh. Oh, where to start? Um, okay. Well, I suppose probably the easiest one, the most amusing one, is probably Wookiee's Wonders, the lady with the killer breasts, perhaps. That was uh, inspired by somebody that I actually work with, uh, believe it or not, who... Um, whose nickname is Wookie, and she is known to have very aggressive breasts. And that was a comment that one of her female colleagues made, and that gave me the idea. I went away and just wrote it, and as a gift, really, as a gift for her. It was her birthday, I seem to remember. And, uh, yeah, that was it. But uh, it's basically a, a tale set in uh, the 50s, 60s London, Soho in particular, about an uh, inspiring journalist who gets involved with the wrong sort of people, basically. There's a bit of a... Do you know uh, Roald Dahl? Did you have the tales of unexpected over there during the 70s and 80s? Um... You know, we might have. I'm just not too too familiar with, with it right now. No. I, I, I think that's probably the Roald Dahl story. He, you know, he obviously wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but he also wrote a lot of stuff for adults, which was this Tales of the Unexpected. Um, probably like your um, I don't know, mystery workshop type program, you know, that sort of thing. There was always a nice twist in the end, and that's kind of, I think... My little homage to roll. Yeah. Um, one of the longer tales in it, I Drip, which was originally just called Drip, um, which is, of course, the, the story that is impossible to sell because it's a story about a man who turns into a glass of water, um, was originally actually a film script, and then became a large book. Um, and then on, took eight years to chisel it down, whittle it down into something, you know, like which is now 64 pages of a short story. But that was the story that broke my heart for years because I could never, never get it right and worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And it wasn't until I got out 
into uh, a, stuck in a thunderstorm, literally stuck in a thunderstorm, and was soaked to my skin that I suddenly realised where the story had to go. It's one of those things. You know, I just couldn't work out how to finish it until I nearly drowned myself. And thought, ah, that's how it ends. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you, I think you like Slaughterhouse Blue, don't you? That's the one you have in the competition. Slaughterhouse Blue and um, the Spanish, Spanish Hotel. Spanish that was one of my favorites. The Spanish Hotel is the one. I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. That's the one you you, at, you uh, entered for a competition. Yeah, the Spanish Hotel. Yeah, that's kind of based probably more on fact than a lot of the others. Strangely enough, there's a lot of fact in Idrip, but um, Spanish Hotel is probably nearer the truth than a lot of them. Um, during the course of my job. I deal a lot with um, uh, injured soldiers, let's put it like that, Um, and people that have uh, gone through a lot of uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and that was a reaction, uh, came out of that experience really. Of working with people that have been through Bosnia and um, other conflicts, so yeah, it, it, it's it's a nasty, isn't it? <laughs> there's a, I think that there's that little ring of truth in it, and uh, and there is, you know, so, yeah. But uh, what else? Some of these stories, I've, I really did set myself the question of what is the strangest thing I could write or what is the most horrible thing I could think of. Um, I was I sort of getting that sense from reading a few of them in there, especially the Moby. <laughs> the Moby, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Moby is just vicious. I think I was you know, in a pretty sort of... Yeah, dark place when I wrote the Moby. <laughs> but although my dark places tend to amuse me greatly when I'm there, um, if a lot of a lot of the short stories of the you know, obviously out there you wouldn't know it, are actually based in actual places. There's two or three sh- short stories that are based in cottages, which is where I'm sitting at a moment, a, a tiny little cottage, out in the uh, in the flat fenlands. Um, where I'm surrounded by dikes, which over here mean great swathes of cut grass. Um, I'm sorry, um, what would you call them? Um, huge ditches. Yeah. You know, and there's a uh, around the wood down the road. There's a there's a, there's a big dike, and over there there's swan dike, and. Apparently, when you say this to Americans, they get confused. I don't quite understand why, really. But when I am surrounded by dikes, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, but they're saying quite, quite, but the Moby is actually um, set in a, a restaurant that actually exists in Boston and was based on um, a certain client that actually I, I, I met in there once and I just thought to myself, hmm, what would happen to him? <laughs> uh, Since we'll be having a small audience, is there anything that you'd like to say to the audience about your book, about what you want for them to get out of it? Um, you know, we're, we're, Anything at all? I think anybody that's brave enough to invest in a copy of this book, I would recommend them as open-minded, brave uh, individuals, human beings. Thank you very much. Um, I would hope they would get sort of thrill out of 
breed in it that you get when you first, perhaps when you've discovered your first work of horror or science fiction, that idea of how can they do that? How has he done that? Why has he done that? And to go away thinking, perhaps I wish he hadn't done that. But, but I'm glad somebody did it. You know, that's, if they go away thinking that was funny or that was strange, but well done, then I'd be very happy. Um, and if they go away thinking that's totally sick in the old English sense of the word, I'd be pretty happy with that too. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, as expectations go, and then they would have my obviously uh, lifelong thanks for uh, investing in it, such a copy. And my thanks, obviously, to your wonderful press for being so brave, and I do mean that brave.